I'm not surprised that people shouldn't shouldn't be concerned about the ocean because they have they are forced to have other problems. And the forces that that make people have problems are the same forces that that pollute uh, our world. On a global scale, major climate regimes can transition one to another. This to me is what the public needs to know, that slow and gradual is not how major climate change works. Something which is typical in the climate system, everything is coupled. So you change something in the ocean and this has a feedback effect on the atmosphere that has a feedback effect on the ocean again and again. Humans have had a long and complex relationship with the ocean, but one that is ultimately dependent on the deep blue mysterious water that covers most of the surface of our planet. The effects of industrial pollution on Earth's seas and oceans, including but not limited to CO2 um, pollution, are not typically discussed in mainstream environmental discourse, despite the critical role that oceans play in creating and sustaining life on Earth. Joining me today to discuss the future systemic risk to Earth's ocean are Professor Daniel Pauli from the University of British Columbia and also the head of the Ocean Fisheries Research and Activist uh, Portal, The Sea Around Us, Antonio Turiel, a theoretical physicist and a marine systems expert from the Autonomous University of Madrid, Spain, and Professor Peter Ward, a paleobiologist uh, and author of 17 books on prior mass extinctions uh, linking Earth's ocean to uh, historical events. All three of these scientists were previous guests on The Great Simplification. This conversation was intense and dark, but I feel it is important one. Without further ado, here's Reality Roundtable number four on oceans. Welcome, bienvenidos, to another episode of Reality Roundtable. Uh, here with me today uh, are ocean scientist Antonio Turiel, a paleobiologist and ocean uh, expert Peter Ward, and ocean fisheries scientist uh, who runs the project Sea, the Sea Around Us, Daniel Polly. And uh, you three, to my knowledge, have never uh, met each other before right now. Um, so you have in common that you are friends of Nate and you care deeply about the oceans uh, and what is happening. And that's why we're here today to discuss what the heck is happening. Um, great to see the three of you. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So um, we're still kind of uh, feeling out the the format uh, of these little roundtables. What I asked you each to come up with is a five or six minute uh, opening statement on what is the most pressing issue uh, in dealing with the world's oceans that you, as a lifetime scientist studying the oceans, would like the general public to to understand. And uh, then the others will ask questions and then we'll have an open discussion. And Professor Pauli uh, in British Columbia, um, let's start with you, sir. All right. So I have a standard lecture I give to lots of people uh, from specialists to non-specialists about, about how human con uh, the human conquest of the ocean or the earth and the ocean. And basically, human came out of Africa uh, 70,000 years ago, and uh, at least some, and uh, became spread all over the place. And the spread was accompanied with the the, the killing of uh, the megafauna in all continents and all islands where, where humans uh, reached. And then agriculture was invented, and also um, the, is the, then the, the plants that suffered, and... Uh, uh, desertification continue, uh, uh, spread, and and now it is continuing. Uh, it's frightening. Then fisheries and fisheries. Uh, we have traditionally fished since ever, since forever, 
but uh, with the uh, with the the launching of the first uh, steam driven trawlers uh, a new a new a new episode in in the the story of fishing came and and this was uh, equivalent to the hunting of the large uh, mammals in um, our continent we and uh, this this uh, steam trawlers were were the civilian equivalent of the of the warships that were developed at the time the first yeah. the steam driven and and steel hulled uh, warships and um, they they made a short thrift of uh, the the fish that were accumulated around the british isles and then spread throughout the world and and this spread uh, i participated in it because in 70 74 and 75 or rather 75 76 i was in indonesia in helping to introduce trawling into indonesia and and basically the uh, industrial Fishing has replaced artisanal fishing, or supplemented uh, and competing against it uh, throughout the world. And and these boats and uh, the, the 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 device they they use to find fish and to locate themselves uh, have been developed uh, for war warfare um, uh, warfare against submarine. Uh, for example, by British, uh, by British, uh, by the British Navy during World War One and World War Two, and 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 this uh, this industrial fishing um, is uh, is equivalent to a war against fish, and we were winning it. So the fish are declining everywhere, especially big ones, and 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 this decline of the fish have spread from industrial. Uh, area from industrialized countries uh, to now to the whole world, and what maintains it is not necessarily the demand, um, the demand that is uh, increasing because uh, our numbers increase, but it is uh, uh, subsidies and uh, subsidies, government subsidies that are given to to fleets, even when they don't work profitably. See, uh, industrial vessels uh, fish um, a resource within 10 years, 15 years, it is essentially gone. And and from 100%, it will be reduced to 5 10% of what it was before. And at that point, the fishery becomes uneconomical, but it is maintained by subsidies. And so, um, about one third of the income derived from, from fisheries is, is subsidies and uh, industrial fisheries. And uh, these subsidies maintain um, the, the overfishing situation and, and maintain an industry which competes against small scale fishers, which are by some, by some notion uh, sustainable. So industrial fisheries are inherently unsustainable and and they can operate in in and continue to fish uh, devastated collapsed stocks because of subsidies so we have to get rid of them if we want to have any chance of of release of release uh, uh, establish an, uh, something that is sustainable then the big problem of our time though is global warming and and climate change and the the small population that we have, the we have reduced the stock to to five ten percent of what they were before, um, has created a situation of, a, of a, the the genetic vari variability that was there in the stocks is not there anymore. So the result of this is that uh, the the stocks and the ecosystem as a whole have little resilience. So we we are not. We will not be able to handle all the stocks. Rather, the ecosystem will uh, be um, endangered, uh, particularly by climate change, because the genetic diversity that would allow would have allowed some of the um, adaptation or through Darwinian mechanism isn't there. So that's why, 
and um, that will be my concluding point. That's why um, there is a strong push in to create marine protected areas throughout the world where the stocks could rebuild themselves. So um, the the big challenge is uh, is temperature that is uh, is too warm for the fish. They have a big problem getting enough oxygen in the in their body when it's warmer both because there is less oxygen in the water and because the metabolic rate increase the the need for oxygen increase so there is we have a real problem on our hands and it it can be solved only really by uh, by reducing our <laughs> greenhouse gas emissions always the same story but for fisheries specifically subsidies have to go I think this conversation uh, may go from slightly depressing to moderately depressing to incredibly depressing. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm taking the, uh, the initiative here that rather than to ask follow-up calls of Daniel, let's just go to the next one of the scientific uh, panelists, and then we'll have follow-up questions after. Uh, Antonio, uh, would you like to, to go next? If I'm going next, this is going to be very depressing, actually. Well, but you haven't met Peter yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I am a physical oceanographer, so I'm working on the physics of the oceans. And I think that currently uh, our concerns, the problem is that we have many different concerns. Um, some of them seem to be really accelerating, especially this year, even if uh, those things have been um, in March, uh, I mean, has been going on uh, since a long ago. The first question has been also raised by Professor Pauli regarding uh, temperature. Uh, the ocean temperature now is arriving to incredible highs. Uh, we have observed this year the sea surface temperature, the average of the sea surface temperature all over the world is completely off chart. It's, we are now almost one degree above the typical values for this time of the year. And there are specific zones at which this value is incredibly high. For instance, in the Mediterranean, it is three degrees above, three degrees Celsius above the average. And in the case of the North Atlantic, it is now 1.4 above the average, which is very large, taking into account that we are discussing about a very large area. And this, of course, is affecting um, sea life in general because the, the increase of thermal stress for the species and also because it is decreasing um, the solubility of the oxygen in the water. So they have less oxygen and also more thermal stress and this is causing a great mortality of species. But for us, which is, I mean, for as a physical sonographer, one of our main concerns regards the effects on climate on the large and the uh, possibility of uh, attaining some tipping points in, in the climate change. So something that has been discussed uh, very extensively during the last uh, days is the possibility of a, a sudden interruption of the AMOC, of the Atlantic branch of the meridional overturning current, which is a huge system of currents that goes around all the world and redistributes um, uh, uh, heat and moisture all over the world. And what we are observing is compatible with uh, slowing down and even eventually uh, detention, interruption of the Atlantic branch of the of the median lower turning current. If this happens, it would imply that all the northern hemisphere will be colder and drier, especially in Europe. At the same time, the accumulation of heat on the ocean surface will be more like will make more likely to have um, huge storms, something that, by the way, is what is happening in Europe this summer. We are observing unusual phenomena. No, no, not, we could not say this has not happened before, this has happened, but the question is that we have an uh, increasing recurrence of tornadoes or very large tempests, almost hurricanes. Uh, that is not so usual, and especially in this, in this big amount in, in Europe. And uh, the problem with the possibility of uh, an interruption of AMOC is that this is at one of the tipping points in climate change, something that will unchain a process in which the climate of the Earth will radically change and make uh, it um, not recognizable, uh, not recognizable 
uh, according to our current standards. But the problem is that this also could pull uh, other tipping points and may force the change of other parts of the climate system. For instance, accelerating the deforestation in the Amazons or uh, forcing also a change in the, in the rains all over the world. So we are very worried because this situation seems to be more and more likely. Something that also we have recently discovered is that the, the climate models by IPCC are too conservative regarding this possibility and the, the succession of events that we have seen during the last years, and particularly this year, are indicating that mm, the models are not are too conservative and not able to describe the situation. And right now, the possibility of having this sudden change in the climate seems to be very likely during this same century. And just to start with, I think <laughs> this is enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Well, yeah, um, we, we have major changes. Well, the Earth and the history has always been about major changes. Clearly, past is prelude. And referring to the AMOC, which I love that term because the Atlantic Meridional Ocean Circulation, or AMOC, it really is running amok, if you will, by slowing down. So we have seen this in the past, which is the sad thing. As recently as near the end of the Pleistocene, 10 to 12,000 years ago, this particular current shut down. But this isn't something that is just a Johnny-come-recently effect on the planet. We have seen the changes of what they called conveyor belt currents. And think about what a conveyor belt is. Ocean currents we think of as something like clouds. We can see them sweeping over the top. They seem to be working in a, a flat dimension. But think of what an escalator does. An escalator will carry you up or carry you down, but those steps, after they dive back down, go all the way down below again before they come up again. So think of the planet's ocean not just as a flat series of currents, but also as vertical currents. And this is the type of current that we're looking at and fearing will stop. It does very important things. The AMOC takes oxygen from very cold surface water, drops it down near Greenland, where it is carried back along the bottom of the Atlantic, back towards the tropics. This particular conveyor belt carrying stuff down below is taking the oxygen necessary to keep marine communities on the deep sea and in midwater alive. When this current stops, oxygen no longer makes it to the bottom. The worst case of this happening coincides with some of the greatest mass extinctions in history. The most recent was at the end of the Paleocene, the PETM, Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, when planetary temperatures went up six to eight degrees globally, and the oceans lost most of their oxygen on the bottom, mass extinction. But even bigger effects happened at the end of the Permian and several times in the Mesozoic. When these currents stop, it leads to the formation of hydrogen sulfide rich bottom waters, which begin to rise to the surface killing marine life on the way up, and then extruding into the atmosphere. So this really is, to me, one of the most dangerous aspects of the coming century. Why is it stopping? It's stopping because Greenland, well, for many reasons, but one of the major reasons we think is that Greenland is melting because of higher temperatures. It is dumping fresh water into the North Atlantic. So why would a surface current that's going to go down as an escalator sink in the first place? This is part of the Gulf Stream, warm, warm tropical water. And as we've seen, going by Florida, we're seeing 100 degree Fahrenheit water off the Florida Keys, unheard of. Well, this stuff was carried up the coast, east coast of North America. It makes places, beaches in New Jersey, tropically warm. So unlike my West Coast, or even down to the middle part of California, if you jump in the water, it's really cold. That's an Alaskan surface current coming south. Well, this current goes up, and then it leaves North America and heads towards Europe. As it does so, it gets into colder and colder climates. The water 
as it gets colder, starts picking up more oxygen. Warm water carries less oxygen than cold water. So this gets ever colder water, picks up ever more oxygen. It gets heavier and heavier, and it finally sinks. And this is the conveyor belt part. The vertical aspect sinking down, oxygen-rich water hits the bottom of the Atlantic and works its way back again, conveyor belt, over and over. Every time this particular, on a global scale, set of currents, and it's not the only one, the other really scary one is off Antarctica. The same thing is happening. And when you're having enormous land-based ice sheets melting, you're dumping fresh water in. That reduces the density of this cold North Atlantic water. Greenland is melting. It's causing the cessation of this current. The warming of the planet is going to shut off these currents. And there will be literally hell to pay. There's a lot of ways I could go with this. Um, but let me ask you three, particularly this follow-up question. It seems like a lot of people are suddenly aware of climate change, not as many as need to be to make uh, effective socioeconomic changes. Why do the ocean issues seem to not be addressed? The, what the three of you just said is rarely shown in the media, yet the ocean represents the vast majority of livable ha habitat on this planet. Um, why is the ocean just such a distant uh, thought in our scientific and, and public uh, discourse. Yes, it's changing, but given what the three of you said, it's hella important this needs to be uh, heard and understood by lots more people. D does anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, my, my thought on this is that um, we are a terrestrial species, and uh, that's the basic reason where, why we don't understand the ocean. Um, uh, our, the relationship of most people to the ocean is on beaches and uh, on cruise ship maybe. But uh, the depth and, and its dynamics I, I are not understood. Another point is, and uh, this reflects my, my present work, and I work not so much on fisheries, but on the physiology of fish. And um, I encountered a, a complete... Um, failure to understand that uh, it is extremely difficult to breathe water. Um, uh, the biologists even have problems with that uh, because to us breathing and, and moving in a medium that uh, is very light, very easy, is, is, is a natural thing. And it's very difficult for us to imagine how it is to breathe water. Uh, uh, there is far less oxygen uh, <laughs> in the water as you would get uh, two times the height of the Everest. Uh, so we, we know what it is to ascend a mountain and, and not be able to breathe. Well, there is very little oxygen. Uh, it's less, far less than on top of Everest, but it's in water, and water has to be moved across the gills of fish to, for them to be able to breathe. So, so big, the, the big problem is that they cannot breathe. And... Uh, and they are problem breathing, and and so you you mess up a little bit uh, the requirement or the demand or the supply, the supply because it's warmer is less oxygen, or the demand because the water is warmer, and they are in deep trouble. And that's the reason why the fish move to the north on the northern hemisphere and to the south in the southern hemisphere because because they cannot handle the temperature in the place where they lived before. And so they move. They move toward the poles in, on both hemispheres. And this is the documentation of this, the presentation of this was 20 years ago, you got a, you could d demonstrate that you got a paper in, in science and now you don't because it's trivial. Everybody knows that, that fish are now moving north in the Northern Hemisphere. And, uh, and uh, in BC, we have fish that uh, we don't we didn't have before we have in mexico <laughs> we, we have even giant squid from mexico uh, stranded people freak out so it's very difficult to imagine to 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 know for the public at large what the ocean is and and it's unfair to expect i think to expect the public at large to know and to care because uh, 
to our neoliberal policy, politics, we have a problem that most people, even in rich countries, are, are, are struggling to end the month and they have to have two, three jobs. And, and because of this, and, and in a, in a, in a, in, in a background of increased productivity, there is, we produce more and, and yet people have, have no money to end up the month and pay the rent and pay the, so, so I don't, I, I, I'm not surprised that people shouldn't, shouldn't be concerned about the ocean because they have, they are forced to have other problems. And the forces that, that make people have problems are the same forces that, that pollute uh, our world. That's the problem. Uh, Peter or Antonio, would you like to add anything there? Yeah, I have my own take on this subject. Uh, I think that there are several reasons for which maybe we have not paid as much attention as so, uh, to oceans as uh, we should uh, have. Uh, first, well, oceanography, the, the oceanographic community is not the largest community in the scientific world. So in, in, we are, let's say, a minority. And there are several reasons for this, apart from tradition and so on. I am talking mainly from a European perspective, which is probably different than that uh, from American one. Um, so the question is, we are not that many. We are not few, but we are not that many first. Uh, second, the, the ocean has always been very hard to sample by obvious reasons, because it's very hard to take measurements. It's much easier to take measurements on the air about the atmosphere that on the ocean you need to install systems that uh, can be destroyed can be lost whatever and you can just sample for a uh, limited amount of of time and then uh, something that i know well um, by working with uh, the european center for medium range weather forecast is that the typical approach to oceans in meteorological models in operational models is quite simplistic. So many physical processes which are important are um, oversimplified. And for instance, something which is crucial in the case of the uh, slowdown or even interruption of, of the AMOC is a variable that is not very well described. It is well known for sure, but it's not very well described, which is salinity. In polar regions, salinity is having a very huge role uh, the price to have measurements of the salinity and typically meteorological models tend to underestimate the role of salinity, the concentration of salt in ocean water, and uh, this is affecting also climate models. So overall, we have been paying attention more probably to the atmospheric part on one hand, and uh, also the question that well, oceans uh, oceans have sound to be much more complex than we thought, or what I mean, the, the public perception of them. And then for sure, there is the same point that we have with climate change in general, because at the end, when you are reporting that there are problems, that the human activity is affecting our environment, and this can have consequences. So there is a tendency to try to move out from the topic, to not want be very willing to discuss this because of the consequences that will have in the economy at large. But this is very similar to, happens, to what happens with other many, other many other topics that overlap, that concerns the, the arrival of the limits uh, or the biophysical limits of the planet. Eh? So at the end, we will need to organize ourselves in a different way and this is very hard to be heard by, in general, politicians, authorities, administrations, also big enterprises. And um, for the people, as Professor Pauli has said, for the people that has problems just to pay the rent, you cannot go there and talk to them about the difficulties proposed by the slowdown of the AMOC because they are going to say, OK, I have many more pressing matters right now. And I, I am not interested in what you are talking me about. I think it's a mixture of all those things. Yeah, this is an interesting topic. And for instance, to me, growing up, um, I was raised on a, a fabulous book brought by my mother for me by Rachel Carson, The Sea Around Us. And it was Rachel Carson, of course, who then later began really telling us how badly we are polluting the ocean and therefore nature. But the problem with understanding and getting the public to worry much more about the ocean is, as my colleagues have alluded to, the visibility aspect. Everything that seems to be going on down there is very difficult to see anything going on there. We can see rapid climate change. We can see uh, 
Arizona and Phoenix going through a month of over 110 degrees. We can't see the raised temperatures in the ocean where even a three or four degree rise in temperature is just as catastrophic or more so. We can't see it. Secondly, I think we all have this belief that the, age, the ocean will save our collective bacon in some way. Um, yes, there are changes coming, but we have the sense that for sea level change, everyone I think recognizes this would be a bad thing. But look, we have these estimates where a meter in maybe 70 years, well, that doesn't sound so bad. That's just an every, any little bit per year. But what the ocean does that I think people don't appreciate, it undergoes enormous state changes in ways that are very non-intuitive. Now, perhaps the most common one that we might think about are La Nina and El Nino, these big current changes that affect global climate. They happen relatively quickly. Within a year or less, we've changed the state from one to another. And it doesn't happen over centuries. It's a very quick change. This is the greatest danger facing us. The ocean is going to go, it's going to undergo an estate change from what we are now seeing as the, the state change that we are used to in a very cold climate. We have ice sheets. We have lots of ice in the water to a change where they're gone and they go relatively rapidly to an entirely different type of ocean, a stratified ocean where we don't have oxygen everywhere, where we only have oxygen in the very top surface area. Look at the Black Sea. There is not a great fishery. There isn't a lot of food coming out of the bottom of the Black Sea. It has undergone a state change to a stratified system that cannot, as my colleague said, it's hard to breathe underwater. It's even harder to breathe underwater when your oxygen is completely gone. So we have a sense that the things are going to unfold slowly. As we go from a day to a night, we can see a hot day slowly recede into coolness, and then a cool night slowly turn into warmth. But what we don't recognize, how quickly on a global scale, major climate regimes can transition one to another. This to me is what the public needs to know, that Slow and gradual is not how major climate change works. And we have already put so much heat into the ocean that it, it's now a sense of what can we save? Rather, can we go back to the state that we were in? I, I said that, I don't know Peter Ward, but I was wrong. I, I use your book all the time. And I, <laughs> I, I just didn't connect. Mm. I'm, yeah, well, he has like 17 books, uh, I'm just Daniel. I'm disconnected most um, of the time, so it's perfectly fine. <laughs> Peter, let me ask a follow-up uh, to that, and all of you can speculate on this. I I'm not an ocean scientist, but I've seen a lot of uh, graphs. Today's July 31st, and we see the sea temperatures are like five degree, five standard deviations of the, the typical anomaly. Uh, one of you mentioned the temperatures off the coast of Florida are 100 degrees. Um, there have been some explanations. Uh, El Nino is causing some outgassing of, of heat. Maybe the Saharan dust storms have something to do with it. But is it possible that we are undergoing one of those state changes right now? Can you speculate on that? Does anyone have any clue? But th things seem different. Uh, and maybe that's my availability cascade because I care about the oceans and climate. And so I'm emotionally uh, applying what I'm seeing to my own uh, priors. But w what do you think? Start with you, Peter. Well, I I'm glad I have a colleague from British Columbia here because um, we both, I think, two years ago underwent one of the most surprising climate effects that I've ever known. I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. I did my PhD in Ontario, but I've lived most of my life on the west coast of North America in this northwest corner. And we have seen temperatures over the last couple of years, unlike anything over my pretty 74 years of life. You know, as a Seattle resident there every year, I've never seen anything like this change of that magnitude where parts of BC were so unbelievably hot, as was Seattle and the entire Northwest, and yet we're seeing this all over the planet. 
we are seeing these crazy temperature changes, and it's even more concentrated in many cases in the oceans. I've had the, the good luck of using baited remote underwater video systems for the last 20 years in the South Pacific. We put down these camera systems of 300 meters. What has happened to the oceans down there is a combination of very oxygen poor water, very warm water, but the complete disappearance of big fish. Uh, I've been diving in those waters. I used to be afraid for my life in Papua New Guinea for sharks. Um, the last 10 years, I haven't seen a big shark. So we've denuded the world of its fish, which is rapidly changing, but it's in hand in hand with the temperature and oxygen changes down there. The, I remember very well the, the heat wave that uh, happened two years ago. And interestingly, um, while uh, in, in Seattle, which is about the size, the Seattle area, the size of Washington, uh, oh, oh, sorry, of Vancouver, um, while there were about 50, 50 people dead, there were five to 600 in, in va Vancouver because, because uh, people don't have air conditioning here. And, and they were surprised that the, the social services and stuff, old people, like, like, like us, um, being stuck in the apartment and being surprised by the heat. And I just, I just worked uh, a, a, a number of travel in Belize. I was in Belize and uh, I were almost choked in, in the field work. And the Belizean who are used to, to the heat, and most of them are of African ancestry, they, they said that they had never seen anything like that. I, I was in China, in Hong Kong, and in Qingdao, and in Xiamen, and, and it was intolerable. And the people in China were, were saying, we never seen anything like this. So it is mm -hmm. happening on a grand scale. I cannot mm -hmm. imagine that this, these temperatures can in, keep on increasing, creeping up without, without massive yeah. Death, and uh, because I'm old, and I could see that I was at the edge uh, when when I when I walked out in the, in the sun, and I can imagine that that it is not in twenty years or in, even in ten years that you're going to be in deep trouble, but in a yes. few years. Antonio, do you have any comments on this? Yes. Well, regarding the question of what is happening, especially this year, because this year seems to be a bit special. I recently prepared a report for the Spanish ministry on this. Um, there are several possible explanations, causes that maybe, well, probably they are influencing the situation right now. But the question is that we don't know yet to which extent and which, uh, which, uh, which is the relative impact of uh, each one of them. There is something which is uh, clear is that the eruption of the Unga Tonga volcano past year that projected a lot of water vapor in the stratosphere may have had an influence because it has increased significantly the amount of water vapor in the stratosphere. But also it should be recalled that the stratosphere is not the place at which the majority of the water vapor is. So the variation is relatively small when you look at the whole of the atmosphere. But this may be causing an increasing of the energy which has been trapped, the greenhouse effect, uh, and so leading to a, a, a increase of the temperature. I don't think this is very large, but it's something that needs to be examined for sure. There are other reasons that could be um, um, could explain part of the things that are happening. Something that we have observed, particularly in the case of North Atlantic, is that there is a significant anomaly with winds, with wind stress. So winds are blowing less in the North Atlantic, and this is leading to an increase of stratification, less mix mixing of ocean waters. And so this could lead uh, to the forming of a warm, a relatively thin warm layer of warm water uh, on the surface, 
but uh, in case that these winds are established, they could mix again, and then the temperature will not be so dramatic in the case of the ocean water and in the case of North Atlantic specifically. Uh, but the problem is that then the question is why the, the winds have decreased so much in, in a speed. No? Um, regarding El Nino, I don't think the El Nino is a leading cause uh, because uh, first, it doesn't seem that this El Nino is going to be as large as, for instance, the 20, the, the 2015, 2016 El Nino. It seems it is going to be relatively normal. And also we are in the starting, in the onset of El Nino that will peak uh, by December. So it doesn't, of course, it has an influence, but it doesn't seem to be one leading influence. But uh, I would like to point out something that uh, was puzzling uh, scientists uh, some years ago is by the beginning of this century, we observed that climate models were forecasting an increase of temperatures, of air temperature, which was not really um, uh, according to what we were, were observing. So the, the increase in the temperature of the air was not as fast as foreseen in the models. And um, some years later, we discovered that all this extra heat was being accumulating in the uh, first 600 meters of the ocean. Um, and so the question was that this heat is being trapped there. Something that may be happening and something that, which is also a matter of concern is that either uh, we are saturating the ability of the oceans to accumulate heat in the first 600 meters, because of course it is large, but it is not infinite. And also it depends on some processes that have uh, given efficiency. So the amount of heat that you can accumulate depends on the ability of this process to, to store the heat inside the ocean. And also some other problem that may be happening is that um, we also know that there is some cyclicity in the processes of, of uh, pumping heat into the ocean and bumping out from the ocean. So the problem is that maybe we are changing this cycle that seems to have a periodicity of about, I don't remember, 40, maybe, I don't remember, 20, 40 years, I don't remember actually. And maybe we are in the opposite side of the cycle. And in this case, the ocean is retarding us, <laughs> the extra heat that he has been accumulating. So there are several things that can be influencing this particular year. But as they have said, is, what is quite worrisome is that it's not a local phenomenon. It's a real global yeah. phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon that is accompanied also by other things which are very worrying, as for instance, droughts. Because uh, the prevalence of droughts all over the world is leading to a failure of the crops in many, in many parts of the, of the, of the world. So this is leading, for sure, uh, to a diminution of the amount of um, of uh, grain, of cereals, of uh, uh, wheat, of all the things that are <laughs> the basic staple for human and cattle food, and and this is going to be this is going to be very bad actually, and this for sure combined with all the other problems that we have. You know, in first instance, in Europe, we are very concerned with the problem that now Ukrainian. Uh, um, grains cannot uh, exit Ukraine, and this is going to affect many countries, especially in Africa and, and other places. So, well, uh, everything that said conspires uh, for the worst <laughs> in that case. But just to see that there are several causes that could explain what is happening this year. We are going to examine all of them in detail. We are going to try to determine what is really going on, but we cannot rule out the possibility that we are starting a process that can last for several years. And the problem is that if we go ahead increasing the temperatures, this is going to be very tough for many people in many parts of the world, for sure. So let me ask a, a follow-up, Antonio, and then get uh, also Peter's um, paleo perspective on this. How does the top 600 meters become saturated, and what happens if it is saturated with heat and it cannot absorb any more? And then, Peter, after he answers that, are there historical analogs when the top layers of the ocean uh, absorbed all they could and then there was a phase shift uh, where it released it? Antonio, do you have any answer there? Well, the question is that at the end, the capability of the ocean to trap heat is while well, is completely associated to the mixing at the end. I mean, you have a transfer by the ocean surface, you have a transfer of heat 
because uh, I mean the normal processes just to have two different things in contact. You have the water, you have the air. They have different temperatures, and then it depends on the ability of the wind to generate waves to mix. And take into account that when you have very intense winds, uh, you have a mixed layer, so in which all the water in the column is mixed, that extends for 20 meters, uh, the very least, and they can have, um, have 100 meters, and in some cases, if you have very, very intense winds, the effect of the mixed layer can extend up to a thousand meters. This is not the usual situation. But let's say, to say something that in many places, it depends completely on the place of the world, but uh, it typically extends several tens of meters and sometimes 100, 200, is, this is completely normal. So the ability of the ocean to gather this heat is uh, strongly mediated by the capabilities of, uh, um, uh, mainly, it's mainly mediated by the mixing. It's the main uh, thing. It's not the only one, of course. Eh? You have convection, you have diffusion, you have many, many other processes that are important in the long run. And this, this saturation effect will be more related to the changes in the global winds, I think. I, I think. I, I'm not completely sure on that. And and the currents, the AMOC, like you guys were talking about before, that too. Well, the question with AMOC, yeah, for sure, because AMOC, uh, the question with AMOC, as, uh, as Professor Ward has explained previously, uh, is, is completely related to also to winds, because winds are the main factor in order to make water dense, because they are favoring the, to dim the diminution of the temperature in the water parcel, and when it is it has reduced uh, enough, you are you are still working with a very salty water parcel because this these waters come from the Gulf of Mexico, from tropical areas. They are very salty. They have they have a lot of salt inside, and uh, when uh, the temperature decreases, this makes these two get very dense, very heavy, let's say, and they sink. So you have a lot of overfloating fresh water coming from the the phoning in Greenland and the sea ice and so on, but mainly on of continental ice. So this very very fresh water, so almost no salt, very low salt, is very hard to be to be sunk. And this, of course, also is contributing to reduce the efficiency in the release of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. And also in in the possibilities of mixing the first the first meters, everything is connected. And sometimes something there's something which is typical in the climate system, everything is coupled. So, so you change something in the ocean, and this has a feedback effect on the atmosphere that has a feedback effect on the ocean again and again. So uh, sometimes it's hard to to say okay, this is a starting here. No, it's something that which is initiated some part of the process, but this is a loop, and this is affecting in a cyclic way. And sometimes, unfortunately, we have these uh, positive feedback loops that tend to increase the problem instead of solving it. Peter, I'm going to let you uh, weigh in on this. But in addition to the question I asked before, I'll, I'll append this part two. Um, can you define a Canfield Ocean? And I know you are no way uh, capable of doing a peer review um, uh, a speculation on it, but just as a human as a scientist what are the odds you think that someday we will have a canfield ocean due to the aggregate of human activities well don canfield was one of the really great scientists in my field as well as in climate science he was a great chemist uh the interesting thing that he looked at he came out of yale i believe and he was able to think clearly about deep time and so instead of looking just at the now, and so many climate scientists today are really students of the present, and the advent of ice cores has truly revolutionized our ability to look back tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. But ice cores only go back 100,000 in most cases, and Canfield and others were able to look back millions of years. So a Catfield Ocean equivalent is, let's think of what's the nastiest swamp you know of. So a swamp is some place where we have very warm water, very little oxygen in it, big bubbles of swamp gas come out, methane, rotting material, and material stops oxidizing. You use up all the oxygen, and the bottom starts producing these bacteria that grow only in the absence of oxygen. And one of their byproducts is hydrogen sulfide, this very toxic, nasty poison. 
Well, Canfield and others began to think, gee, maybe in the past, especially during the great mass extinctions, take that swamp model and stretch it to the global ocean. Could there be a case where we don't have overturn, that we have a warm surface and a warm bottom with no oxygen throughout? Well, we, we have seen cases in the deep past where that has been the case, and it's come about by the study of biomarkers. One of the really great clues was the discovery that many types of bacteria in their body walls, the fat of their cell walls, leave fingerprint-like molecules. And there are such things. There are some nasty, what well, I call them nasty, bacteria that are photosynthesizers. They need to live in sunlight, but they cannot live if there's any oxygen in the ocean. And they produced a long biomarker called isorenirotane. This is the product of green sulfur and purple sulfur bacteria. Again, these things need light to live, so they have to be in the shallow ocean. But they can't have oxygen around them. So we have evidence now during the Permian period, 251 million years ago, of a majority of the global ocean that was also dropping sediment. So we're talking about shallow water deposits where there were surface bacteria indicating the surface waters were without oxygen or very low concentrations. This is totally unlike anything that our planet has seen. Even the Black Sea, next to the surface, there's enough wind, there's enough mixing, that there is a mixed layer of oxygen at the top. To get these big bacterial blooms of the Permian, you would have to have a very, very different world than today. And this is where this idea, the concept of uniformitarianism, that the present is the key to the past, totally breaks down. There's nothing in the present that can get us to understand what's going on in the Permian on a global scale. It was really different. And of course, it led to an enormous extinction of oxygen-loving organisms. The big mass extinction killed off the oxygen breathers. The world became a global swamp. This is the direction we are moving now. So um, one thing that uh, should, could, could have been mentioned up to now is that uh, the it was mentioned several times that the winds um, are diminishing overall globally. And uh, the reason for this is that uh, the pole uh, are warming faster than tropics. And then uh, then the wind is nothing but a, a, a balance act, balancing act between these two. And therefore, there is overall less wind because there is less, the gradient is less. And it's also the reason why the jet stream instead of being fast and, 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 and straight, is now meandering, meandering around the globe, which uh, is uh, falsely uh, labeled as a globe, uh, polar vortex. In the US, uh, the public doesn't understand what it means. It means that in California, you can be cold, and in uh, the East Coast, you can be very, very warm, and, 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 this is um, because uh, one of the meanders uh, goes straight to the U.S. And there is such meanders also over the Black Sea and, and over Asia. And, and they, I've never seen in, a, in a, the TV programs any explanation, any, any simple explanation uh, for this meandering, which, which is straightforward. You can explain it as, but because the gradient, because it's flat, because it's flat. And, the point about uh, the Canfield Ocean that I want to say is we already have little Canfield Oceans and they are called dead zones. Uh, in the uh, Mississippi Delta, in, um, in Oregon, in, in, the, in the East China Sea, in various places uh, of the world, there are about 500 uh, dead zones in the Baltic Sea, the the, the 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 Black Sea and so on, they are dead zone, but they are increasing and they are increasing in duration. If they are seasonal, they are in, increasing in scope. So, what is worrisome is that if they if they become permanent instead of being summer event, if they become if they connect with each other, then we will have 
the beginning of a Canfield Ocean. We could have that locally uh, in a part of the ocean, and then it would spread like a disease because, like, a good, because uh, once the animals start dying, they rot and they, con- they, they, they contribute to the to to the uh, to the spread of this. Uh, so it becomes uh, a self uh, feeding um, uh, process. So I I would not I would not I would not argue that uh, we 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 cannot have ever something resembling the the Permian uh, 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 extinction because because actually we are on our way and we are helping by killing the animals. Uh, before they have a chance to 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 choke to death <laughs> and 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 this warming thing it 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 very well could become self accelerating uh and the ice the ice melting can actually prevent this thinking of that uh, antonio talks about uh and uh, the renewal of the of the deep water and so i'm i'm i had physical oceanography as a minor, and I understand all of this, and and this is scary as hell. There's a lot of different ways, gentlemen, that I could go um, right now, but if you'll recall my invite to you a couple months ago, we were going to have a fourth panelist, uh, DJ White, who co-wrote three books uh, with me and was one of the original founders of of Greenpeace, and he wrote a question, a long one, that I'm going to read here to get reactions from each of you. Uh, This is from DJ White. My big paralyzing worry, as one who has gotten to know dolphins as people, is that food web collapses occurring in the coming 1,000 years, but locked in this century, which scour the seas of most K-selected species, which are generally fairly vulnerable in food webs. The loss of coral alone would do huge damage to ocean food webs, and that is no longer even controversial, now is happening within a human lifetime. Loss of calcifying plankton, increased energetic difficulty of animals with calcium endoskeletons to exist, all happening at the same time that human pollution messes with them and there's a tragedy of commons war against sea life. It's too much. Most of the high self-aware species of Earth are not apes like us. There are maybe 50 species of pelagic cetacean peoples or more, and we're setting up their likely extinction. The fact that nobody is really talking about this as an immediate concern is very scary to me. Turning it around, just how would a species of pelagic dolphin be expected to survive all this stuff at once with niches simultaneously being claimed by very effective opportunistic simple organisms? I think we're committing the biggest crime it is possible for a conscious being to commit. The seas represent something between 97 to 99% of Earth's living habitat. The part we care about is a rounding error. We only think about the oceans in terms of how they affect us and what we can extract in the extreme short term. Uh, that's a pretty strong statement from my friend and colleague, uh, DJ, but do you, each of you have any thoughts, uh, on either the science or the, uh, the emotion behind that? So in the med, for example, in the Mediterranean, um, um, they catch tuna, the juvenile tuna and, uh, fatten them in, uh, cages and for export to Japan. And they are fattened at the tone, at the tune of 10, 10 to 20 kilogram of, of fish for one kilo of tuna. And, uh, this has led to, uh, the, uh, uh, hunt on, on the last sardines in, in the med, than sardine and similar small fish. And they are literally taken out of the mouth of people because, uh, sardines are. No. In Spain, for example, when I was a kid, I, I ate sardine in a, in, in a bun, and it was the best thing in the world for kids. Uh, and, uh, they are, they are not available anymore to people to, for people to buy because the, the mafia, and this is really a mafia operation that sells this tuna to you. The Yakuza in Japan, other gangsters, 
they have completely monopolized the 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 availability of 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 sardines now that has led to a situation where in um, in eastern in the eastern med the dolphin that are there the common dolphin are uh, I have, uh, this is something that I had never seen and I never thought I would see it. The, the dolphin that swim have nothing to eat. So you can see the rib cage, like a monkey dog. And that is, I had never seen before. Uh, a dolphin, you can see the rib cage because they have nothing to eat. And that is the case in, uh, in Eastern, the Eastern Med and I presume also in the Western Med uh, that, that uh, the marine life has nothing to eat anymore because it all goes into tuna uh, fattening operation. And and that is a, a, one example of the madness of it. Uh, in West Africa, the same thing is happening. The sardines uh, that were eaten by people go into fish meal that is exported mainly to China uh, and, and to produce in aquaculture, uh, Aquaculture, an aquaculture form, a form of aquaculture that actually consumes fish, uh, because uh, because it 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 produces it, it uses relatively cheap fish to produce expensive fish, and the destruction of uh, of uh, of large marine uh, marine po- marine mammal population will will actually be accelerated by plastics, because they they really suffer from from plastic uh, that uh, fills a gut and and so i don't know which of the of of the of these forces will will be first the that the the plastic problem will will um, cause them cause them to the population to be reduced or or they will have no food and this is also the case for for the uh, syrenian uh, the sea cow the 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 manatees in in Florida they have nothing to eat and and there is a program to give to give them lettuce to they put tons of lettuce in the water for manatees to eat because the seagrass is gone so all these things together mean that marine mammals will 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 be will a huge amount of marine mammal will be lost. Peter or Antonio, would you like to comment on the Ocean Food Web uh, um, query by DJ? I will say yes to things because I am not a biologist, so probably Peter could have more interesting things to say, but uh, yes to things that I, I have been evoked by that question. First, uh, about this simplification of ecosystems, this is something that we are seeing in some parts of the Western Mediterranean right now in which we have very simplified ecosystems, in which we have almost nothing on on the floor. This is as a species. I need to to see how this is said in English because I don't know. But um, and you have uh, jellyfish on surface. So this is these are very, very, very simplified ecosystems. And it's something that that is this happening in many places because uh, well we we have um, this overfishing and we have these factories for fattening the the tuna fish uh, we have a couple here in Spain and this is as uh, as he has said so uh, well, the word I was looking for sea urchin so we have sea urchins in sea the urchin urchin exactly sea urchins on the on the floor and we have jellyfish on the surface and that's that's it. Huh? It's a very simplistic ecosystem. I don't know how it is made. It, it can even work, but it's something that we are observing in many places in, in the Western Mediterranean right now. The other, the other the thought that was coming to my mind, something that is happening is quite anecdotal, but it's also interesting, is that um, uh, we have observed uh, during the last months a continuous um, uh, series of attacks by killer whales against judge so they are they are breaking uh, parts of the judge so making them not possible to to, to navigate and this is continuous so the, for some reason probably one killer whale was um, hit by one of the judges and uh, 
it learned to, to, to attack it, and um, it has taught this to other killer whales. So now they are devoting their force to try to interrupt the, the transit of yachts uh, across, mainly across the Gibraltar Strait, uh, so it is passed from the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic. Uh, well, <laughs> it, it is a desert problem, it's quite anecdotal, but I think it's also a, a powerful message uh, there. Say, okay, they're they're fighting you know, back. They're fighting back, yeah. In some sense, well, this is quite a romantic view of the <laughs> thing, probably it's much simpler than that. <laughs> but, but it is interesting anyway. Peter, on the trophic food web yeah, question. I, one of my, I guess one of my hats I sometimes wear is the term astrobiologist, trying to think of Earth as just one planet that might have life. Um, if you start thinking about it, as, as some of the astrobiologists have done, try to decouple diversity, the number of species, from abundance of life. So we can look at life in terms of productivity so you can measure that but what about what if we just had a simple measure of the number of kilograms of living matter on the planet when would it have been highest the idea about mass extinction is that like a gary larson cartoon you go walking in front of all the homes of the dinosaurs and the little sign up on their doors extinct 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 everybody's gone desert world empty that's totally wrong my I guess some of the calculations I've been playing with is that biomass increases in mass extinctions because you go ever lower down the food chain. You get more and more bulk. We worked in in Western Australia at Windsor the Gorge, this fabulous Devonian reef, which has been left stranded without any sort of tectonic effect on it. It's a giant barrier reef that is 360 million years old. And as you walk through the gorge, cutting through it, you see beautiful coral reefs that there's a rapid extinction. You see the black water, the oxygen poor water, the sediment, the the Biomarkers indicate that we had one of these Canfield Oceans, and then we have the reef lives. It continues, but it's no longer produced by animals. It's a microbial reef, and they keep building, and they even build bigger reefs than before. There's slime. There's slime that can produce calcium carbonate. That is the ocean we're moving towards. So one of the, the laughs for me, I love cephalopods, and this this big fight, global fight, all through geological history, the fish and the cephalopods have been duking it out. Well, in 2014, a team from University of Adelaide, where I was for that year, came up a very influential paper, the cephalopods are increasing. As we wipe out fish, there's more and more cephalopods. And all you need to do is walk on one of these Triassic, Jurassic, mass extinction boundary in England or anywhere else, or the end of the Cretaceous, or the end of the Permian, the first thing out of the gate are cephalopods. And I was luckily enough, went off to Papua New Guinea in 2022 and spent a month at Caviang, New Ireland. And our cameras go down there. There's nautiluses everywhere down there. No fish. Lots of Nautilus. There they are. Save the Nautilus. Well, we're saving them by killing all the fish. There's plenty of them down there. The cephalopods are doing fine, thank you. But we are going into a case where diversity is dropping, but abundance of life on the planet may not be. So there, well, there would be an abundance of life, just far less complex, yep. large life. Yep, lots of mic microbial yeah. slime. So is this, uh, gentlemen, ocean uh, scientists and activists, is this the ocean version of the movie uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio called Don't Look Up? Is that what's happening here? Is we, we won't do anything until it's so obvious the disaster that's happening to the oceans that it'll be too late to do something? No, my sense of it, this is Medea hypothesis. This is Medea. Uh, this is not Gaia. <laughs> this is the, the black, evil twin of Gaia. This is life doing it to itself. We humans are life. Well, life is really going to constrict itself here from complexity to simplicity. So uh, the trouble is too many people haven't been looking. Don't look up, don't look down, don't look anywhere. The problem is people have not been looking at the ocean, as my colleagues have so eloquently said. So, so let me ask you guys this. Um, 
a lot of the things that we would as a global culture do to help avert the worst of climate scenarios would also help the ocean situation. But are there things we could do separately to help the oceans that would be distinct from the the climate uh, action and, and mitigation? Are there things we could do to help the ocean situation? Daniel, you want to start? Yeah. What I mentioned uh, when I when I made my introductory uh, speech uh, that uh, subsidies are one of the motors mm-hmm. of overfishing, and overfishing is one of the causes for the lack of resilience of uh, of uh, ecosystem, marine ecosystem. So, if you could get rid of uh, subsidies, then uh, you you would have some stocks bouncing back. We have also produced, proposed, um, and it's not impossible um, to close the high sea to fishing because it's essentially a place where you can go only when if you are subsidized. And this sounds like a crazy idea, but uh, this the suggestion that uh, countries should have exclusive economic zone extended 200, 200 uh, miles offshore was also crazy when it was proposed by some Latin American countries, Chile and Peru. And uh, 20 years later, we had uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So I think these two goals um, um, could be uh, helping, at least from the uh, removing the fisheries. Because let's face it, uh, the various things that we talked about are not designed to kill marine biodiversity, but fisheries is. Fisheries is designed to kill marine animals and to remove them from the ocean. And so if we could get rid of subsidies and the agreement uh, at the WTO, the World Trade Organization, is a lousy agreement, but it is possible that uh, that uh, a better agreement come because uh, the the right-wing market market first fanatics are also against subsidies not only the conservationists so we could get rid of subsidies and and maybe we could also get part of the high seas close to fishing and we could monitor that easily and these are measures that have nothing to do with uh, with the global emission of greenhouse gases and it would help the ocean a lot Daniel, let me ask a a follow-up question to you. I had sent you an email a few weeks ago. I didn't understand this, but there's some uh, science that shows that totally healthy, rejuvenated ocean fish populations themselves would have a positive effect on climate change. Can can you explain that? Wh- what what that means? Uh, we, uh, the chemist. I, I'm not a good chemist, but uh, but essentially. Uh, 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 teleost fish, uh, bony fish, uh, excrete uh, uh, in the feces uh, calcium carbonate, I think, or something that that uh, uh, remove uh, remove some of the carbon from the sea, and 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 so they themselves would contribute. And also, when, in an age, in a time when tuna were dying of natural causes, the carcasses would drop. To the floor, to the floor. There's an entire community of animals that eat whales and and uh, 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 carcass fall and tuna uh, that fell to the floor, to the to the bottom of the sea. And these these we have uh, these fluxes that uh, remove carbon from the atmosphere. We have uh, interrupted them and turned them around. And so uh, we if we had lots of fish in the sea. Uh, they they would actually contribute uh, a little bit uh, to offset the effect of uh, greenhouse gases. Yeah, Peter Antonio, are there any things we could do ocean specific? Uh, you know, leaving climate aside, uh, that would improve the ocean's chances. Well, yeah, we do the reverse of the movie The Graduate. Um, our poor hero is asking an adult, "What should I go into?" And the answer is plastic. Well, I think we need to reverse the plastic, as my colleagues have stated, that the ocean is being strangled by plastic. 
one of the saddest things for my life has been working year, every year in the Philippines. And of course, when you go out on a field trip, you need lots of stuff, right? Sundries. And in the Philippines, in every drugstore, every item you buy, let's just say it's tooth mouth, toothbrush, or band-aids, or whatever you get, they put every single item in its own plastic bag. So even a small shopping accumulates 20 or 30 or 40 plastic bags in a big plastic bag. They all end up in the ocean and they break down under that sun. And we are now, we know from the deepest part of the Marianas Trench, plastic is everywhere. I, I would like to add something on top of this in the same sense, because I think that something will be very useful is to reduce all, all the inflow of plastics going to the ocean. We know that the majority of macroplastics are coming by the rivers. And there has been some interesting experiences, even in California, uh, just controlling what is going down the river. Because typically what happens is that people abandon a plastic object or whatever. And at the end, by the way, this finish uh, going to the river and from the river it goes to sea. So there are some relatively easy, uh, relatively easy ways to contain this plastic before arriving to the sea in which it will be reduced, broken up, uh, until it becomes very small. Another significant thing that can be done for sure is to reduce the use of plastic. The plastic is too widespread, it's completely absurd, it makes no sense, you know, it's not useful, and in fact, plastic, I think, is too valuable to, to be used the way it is used, because there are some specific uses in an industry in which it will be preferable to have this plastic for that. And something also which is important has to do with clothing. Um, the vast majority of microplastics arriving to the ocean come from the microfibers that uh, are, get out, are getting out from our clothes uh, when we are putting them in the washing machine. So um, this is important because uh, these microplastics are directly entering, entering the, the food web. It's affecting all the life in the ocean. It's affecting ourselves also. So it, we should change the way in which we are making clothes. <laughs> Because uh, we should do it in a very different manner, maybe using more cotton, I don't know, or maybe not uh, not, not elaborate in the way the, in which they are elaborated. And also to complement the things that uh, the professor probably has said, um, um, some, something that we know for sure is that uh, healthy uh, ecosystems are very helpful in precisely in capturing, in capturing CO2 because uh, there are many ways in which the ocean captures CO2. Uh, he has indicated several. So it's, it's not only the, the, the skeletons of the, of the fishes, but also, in general, also the, the exoskeletons of algae, the microscopic algae. And there is a continuous balance between organic carbon dissolved in the water, inorganic carbon dissolved in the water. And when you have a healthy ecosystem, the ocean acts as a real trap for CO2. So just allowing the life in the oceans to thrive is also very interesting from the point of view of fighting climate change and from the carbonization. And for that reason, also it's very important when we are planning, doing some activities, some industrial activities on the ocean, that is, we should not be disrupting ecosystems uh, even more. And I'm thinking here about, for instance, some offshore uh, wind farms that are planned in places which have a lot of uh, biodiversity. This is not the place to place to place this kind of uh, of facility, and also, especially, um, also mining, which for me is a completely absurd thing because it is too too energy intensive, so it's too costly. But they are still thinking about this kind of stuff, and even if they probably not not going to operate in the large scale. This is the kind of things that you should not do uh, if you want not to disrupt these ecosystems that are so valuable on its, uh, on themselves and also for our own interest uh, of fighting climate change. Is there anything on the geoengineering front involving oceans uh, like green sand or, or, or things like that, olivine uh, crushing? Is there anything that is potentially viable on the horizon or are they all Frankenstein sorts of um, uh, out of the uh, frying pan into the fire? Uh, uh, Daniel, would you like to comment? These um, techniques are all dangerous because imagine imagine we would uh, put uh, particles in uh, sulfur particle in the in the sky we would have a fleet of plane darkening the skies and then we would we would be 
we would continue with the mission. Obviously, uh, the the ocean would further uh, acidify and everything, and then uh, we would have a reduction of the temperature for a few years. And if it worked, and then the whole thing would be exploding when 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 the system. Uh, is pushed to to some limit, and I would like to add a, a little thing. Uh, I'm a friend with lots of people from the Aboriginal communities here, and in the north of of, uh, of um, British Columbia, in so-called Haraguay, the a bunch of crooks from uh, some from California came and sold to the village elder the notion that they would grind up a few Volkswagen and uh, throw them in the water and this would produce lots of salmon. And they got from the from these people, from the tribal council, one million buck and they went away with it. Uh, uh, and uh, obviously, <laughs> obviously you couldn't distinguish what they have done from the normal spring bloom of, of zooplankton of zo and phyto and zooplankton and and this was this was a bunch of hucksters and this this stuff i i see it as uh the same thing on a giant on a on a global basis peter antonio on the um uh on the uh geoengineering topic any any words i don't know enough to know other than i certainly thought thought that the, the the idea of putting sulfur in the atmosphere, as was just mentioned, is such a terrible idea, and I think it's equivalent to what people have said for trying to help out the oceans. At this stage, we don't know enough to know what these things will do, and in all probability, they can just make it worse. Well, the question is that putting sulfur in the atmosphere, when it combines uh, with water, it gives uh, sulfuric mm -hmm. acid, that is, is the acid rain. And also this creates a lot of health problems in the ecosystems and so on. It's a really very bad idea. And in, in fact, we have done the opposite experiment because since uh, 2020, we have in, in, in force the new maritime uh, regulation that forces the ships to use um, uh, fuels that uh, create less uh, SO2 emissions, less, uh, uh, well, these emissions of uh, sulfur. And what is happening in places that were heavily contaminated, at especially in Europe, is that this, this sulfur was creating a dimming. So this was creating a scream between us and the middle layers of the atmosphere. So we are, were not experiencing it in all its intensity, the climate change now that we have removed all the sulfur. The temperatures on land on Europe have increased probably because of that, and also in parts of the ocean for which the ships were passing continuously. So, uh, in general, it is very dangerous because you are not aware of what you are doing. You can trigger out a lot of other processes that you don't know, all those intended consequences. The chemistry of these substances tend to create something which is very bad, and in general, I, I think it's, it's a very bad idea. There are other kind of geoengineering, which is a specific of the ocean that has been discussed uh, quite frequently, is uh, fertilizing the oceans using iron. Because the problem that we have in the, in the oceans is that um, there are a scarcity of several uh, specific chemical elements, and iron is one which is a scarce. So when you are uh, disseminating iron dust in parts of the ocean, you can generate artificial blooms of algae. And this algae in dying, in principle, should be uh, capturing this, 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 this CO2 because in their exoskeletons, they, they are formed by, by carbonates. So they are capturing this and going to the floor of the ocean. So this will be good. And this is the idea behind this. The problem with this is that you can create such a big amount of blooms that you can really kill a lot of ecosystems. This is absolutely, <laughs> it's a very nasty idea. And you can, at the end, create, a, a, you can create a collapse of all these ecosystems. And then even if you wanted to uh, go ahead, fertilize the ocean to create more blooms, maybe this is not going to have any effect because probably you have not the algae there. So in general, Mm, these these things uh, about geoengineering, I think that they are very dangerous because we have the we are under depression. We have in the control of the situation, but we are not. There are many unintended consequences. There are many processes that we don't know, and we will go for doing something the larger scale without having tested this before. This is very likely to happen, and this is very likely to to turn on the worst side. Yeah, I mean the 
the arc of the story of the twilight zone that we're living in suggests to me that once we get desperate we will try something systemically blind uh, like like the things you guys were just mentioning um i want to be um uh faithful to the time estimate i gave you all because i know you're very busy uh, I have one final question to ask you. I, I could keep this going for four hours. Um, you guys are all uh, separately uh, heroes of mine that you've spent your life work and um, life force uh, on behalf of understanding what's going on in the oceans and uh, the, the, the science. So I really am grateful to you as human beings for your dedication to this. A closing question for each of you. Um, if there was one question that as an ocean scientist, you would like to ask society, those people watching and listening to this program, for them to consider um, in order to solve a problem in an area of your specialty that you're working on, what what would that be? What, what question or issue would you like listeners to consider? I was in, um, in Hong Kong and in China a few days ago and um, um, the same question came up what and um, basically the question was that in Hong Kong um, they the people see uh, the ocean only via food via seafood this is the only way they they appreciate the ocean and uh, the point was being made that that the ocean doesn't is not a larder. It's not. It's not only a provider of food. And in fact, it is. If we see it only as a larder, we will lose the food. The food provisioning that the ocean provide. So we have to look. I, I would say, uh, we have to learn. We have to try to get the people to see the ocean as more than. Uh, a provider of food, and and thus we have to rein in the fisheries, especially the overfishing, in order to maintain the ocean uh, doing its own thing. Because its own thing is maintaining life in the uh, on Earth. I could I could say something on that. I am now thinking more on the physical part of the ocean. I think that if I should pose a question to anyone regarding the oceans and what is happening, something to make they, they then think about it, is do you want to fear the ocean, to be scared of the ocean? Because, for instance, here in Spain, we have a lot of population living by the ocean. It's something which is general of the, all the countries that have um, coasts. And the problem is that, for instance, in some areas here in Spain, the water now in the Mediterranean is so hot that it starts to be uncomfortable even to take a bath there because it's very, very hot, actually. And um, the question is that as the amount of heat stored in the ocean increases, this makes that any tempest, any storm coming from the ocean is going to be more and more violent. And in fact, we want to live by the oceans because there are many values of be living by the oceans. But we don't like, we don't want to be destroyed <laughs> by the oceans. So, and that kind of tempest that we are discussing are really becoming very dangerous. It's not the typical tempest that we see here. So, for me, the question is: Do you want to be able to to live by the ocean? Do you want to have the ocean as an habitat? At which you can you can live by the side. You you want to be there, or you want to live a life in which you will be scared for anything who comes with the ocean in the in the form of these uh, huge uh, storms and so on. This is something that I think that people should think about: which kind of environment we want to have, even for ourselves. Yeah, I think about the the, the greatest single threat that I see to current human civilization is going to be a lack of food. And a lack of food is going to be coming from already, as we've seen, overfishing. But also, as we melt the ice sheets, the continental ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, sea level rise is taking out low-level rice fields everywhere. I mean, salt goes sideways. Hungry people are politically unstable people. 
warfare. Look up, we've done how much carbon dioxide has gotten into the atmosphere because Russia attacked Ukraine. The U.S. is building armaments like crazy. The Russians are. We have stopped the sense of a global sense that climate change is really the biggest problem. Now dealing with yet another global war. We've got to save the ice sheets. We've got to keep ice because if we lose ice, we really lose sea level and we lose food and then we lose peace. Thank you all. Um, I, I am really reluctant to end this call because you all have such um, scientific uh, knowledge to contribute and also human uh, vulnerability and honesty. And uh, maybe we could do this again um, because there's a lot that we didn't cover about the importance uh, and risks of world's oceans and seas. So thank you to the three of you. Maybe the three of you now that are introduced could write some uh, mind and future changing academic paper together. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases. 